Hello and let's talk about the latest in the world of cricket. The fate of the T20 World Cup scheduled for October November will be decided by the International Cricket Council today. There is increasingly a consensus that the event may be difficult to hold. If it does not happen there is a possibility that the Indian Premier League might be held at the same time but not in India but in the United Arab Emirates. Now the IPL will definitely bring with it its own its own set of challenges. We talked to Leslie Xavier on some of these issues. Thank you Leslie for joining us. So a lot of developments this week in the world of cricket both the international level and the Indian level. So let's maybe first start talking about the international level and the world cup itself could you just take us through what is right now happening and what do the prospects look like? So it's it's connected intrinsically the international as well as the domestic level I'll get to that. Uh, so uh, last two months there have been a lot of deliberations on whether the ICC World T20 the T20 World Cup that was scheduled for November in uh, in Australia should be held or not and uh, the deliberation uh, partly and allegedly was caused by the BCCI's insistence that they need to hold the IPL a lot of money at stake on that department so they need to hold the IPL this year at whatever the uh, cost and the only window available is the window that uh, that is reserved for the T20 World Cup so uh, if the world cup is not held obviously ipl get that chance to to be staged but uh, that decision is uh, pending it would the deliberation will start at the icc later right. i mean via video conferencing later this this day and uh, most likely uh, the world cup would be i mean if at all a decision they come to a decision because this has been postponed the last two months so uh, yet to they they were play, uh, they were playing a wait and watch game because uh, uh it's a big call world world cup and uh, with cricket restarting the action happening in england the england versus west indies series there was hope that uh, the same formula can be applied in organizing the tournament down under but the po- point that goes against the tournament over there is it's a world cup it's not two teams that are involved it's it's many teams again but cricket being a smaller world cup maybe it can be made possible uh, but the other point being cricket australia doesn't stand to gain a lot from this exercise but but the, i mean compared to the risks that are that are that are in place right. so uh, firstly spectators won't be allowed in so the gate revenue goes out of the window so ca would be fully dependent on on broadcast okay. revenue which 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 gets which gets i mean uh, distributed to various entities various stakeholders so it's not cs but the gate revenue would have been completely created in australia so so starting with that there are a lot of things that are at stake which would go against uh, cricket australia uh, holding this plus bcci has uh, i mean more or less extended an incentive for ca to back off though i am not saying that that's the reason why ca is backing off in the first place because there is a tour there is a test tour that is been planned where right. india will go go to australia in december right. so that's a big stake that's that's that has more money at stake than than the world cup for cricket australia because the revenue is higher so most likely the world cup would be postponed and then that opens the window for the ipl okay right absolutely so uh, now regarding the ipl itself there are again a lot of controversies the first question maybe is that how uh prepared do you think are we to actually conduct the ipl so uh, last week we were having a discussion within the news click sports desk about uh, whether in india the, it is uh, feasible at all to have a eco bubble kind of a setup mm-hmm. so in england what is happening is the both the test matches that are happening are being held at venues old trafford as well as southampton where hotels are there in the stadium facility itself five star right, hotel right. Right. so the players are practically staying at the venue they are not going out anywhere training playing right. spending time in the hotel i mean and everything is well defined it it won't be possible in india and also having a centralized setup where one or two or three venues for all these teams to play through the ipl season that's also logistically difficult because of the uh facilities for boarding of these of these players it has to be in hotels around the stadium and absolutely, so absolutely. so it's a logistical nightmare that way and uh, bcci has decided i mean so the things have already been set in motion even before the world uh, fate of the world cup 
uh, is is decided last week itself there were talks and reports citing sources that there have been directives given to the IPL franchises to start preparing for taking their teams to UAE and the this season's IPL would be held in 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 the UAE why UAE because stadium facilities are there uh, Abu Dhabi they might be uh, using as the place for the teams to put up uh, and also BCCI is thinking that logistically as far as security and safety of the players are concerned it's 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 uh, it's easier to create a secure environment in, in the in the middle east than than in india where a lot of factors come in including fans including i mean uh, uh, movement of players from the venue to the stadiums and all these things so and also cases are spiking in the country so these are these are the various factors that bcci took into consideration uh, also probably the hidden factor that world cup they know more than what we know that the world cup is going to be postponed so already the directives are out there and uh, uh, teams are mulling whether to convene the players in india quarantine them here create an eco bubble and then obviously private jets would be used chartered flights would be used to take them to to the uae where they would be quarantined again for 14 days and after that the tournament starts or whether the play, foreign players should convene in uae directly so all these factors they have been deciding a lot of x y z are there so uh, so the things have been set in motion that's that's the, that's the thing so there are a few points which which uh, which are important which the bcc should look into it while uh getting into um uh, in organize steps to organize the matches and the first being the lesson learned from england so the second match is ongoing i mean uh, before the second match started teams were traveling from uh, southampton to uh, manchester to old trafford right. and so english players for some reason were allowed to use their own vehicles to travel they were driving their cars but they were given a set path to follow stop overs here 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 right. and don't take any detours just go straight to the other venue right and right. west indies uh, team obviously traveled by the team bus right. so jofra archer the english fast bowler west indian born english fast bowler he decided to take a 100 mile detour and visit his family his friend or family that's not clear yet so right. uh, subsequently has been uh, he was barred from taking part in the match he has been asked to quarantine himself because it's a safety right. compromise he, he might have got, i mean got an infected by exposing himself like that because the place was supposed to be in the eco bubble and the kind of money that is at stake the kind of reputation that is at stake cricket's future in itself was at stake and then mm-hmm. irresponsible behavior so ecb was very harsh on i mean very hard on coming i mean punishing Archer to set an example that such things won't be won't be tolerated. So this is the cricket national cricket board that's that's organizing this these matches, and uh, supposedly national cricket boards have more control and are more exactly. stricter on the players and uh, directives and everything would have been much more clearer and enforced with with clarity compared to IPL clubs. That is so IPL clubs. We know. when the ipl is being staged in uh, i mean the last 10 years we know how i mean it's 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 quite a pandemonium i mean players are there some players would like to i mean be a little lax about what they what they do after the playing after after matches or between matches and uh, the clubs private entities as they are that, that much of a, of a of a strict control over the players and their behavior having said that we are talking about professionals also so the this players coming in hopefully won't be a, i mean would have learned their lesson from jofra archer and Absolutely. would be serious about about the repercussions if they if they decide to jump quarantine and all that and it's it's happened not just in cricket by the way footballers uh, league action is happening there are many many footballers who who that did that couple of tennis players in that infamous djokovic tour Course, they had a they had, they had a party at monaco yes. and so so uh, these things are happening around and uh, that's one risk that BC, bcci 
should take into the IPL governing council, council or and the BCCI as well should take into consideration. Uh, so that I mean, the players are briefed, the teams are briefed also as to the right. seriousness of the of the issue and uh, be much more stricter than what they are usually in a normal season of the IPL. Right. That's just the start. Beyond that, uh, logistically, they should have a uniform. I feel that they should have a uniform protocol in place. So, so what is happening now is that there are some teams which believe that uh, all the players should be convened at training camp in India before and I mean at least the Indian players and they should they should be in a controlled environment and then from here get tested then travel to UAE then go through their pro, uh, quarantine systems and then start playing while some teams believe that they all the players can directly just convene at the airport and fly out and because anyways the quarantine will happen in the UAE and test can be there so that's that that comes with with it its own risks the first scenario also come as its own on difficulties to implement. So here yeah, the lesson should uh, that we should take into consideration is what uh, what that was taken by I mean what what happened in Pakistan before they travel to because before the players convened to travel to England. So they were convened haphazardly. Everyone came to where the test happened and suddenly like 10, 12 people I mean 10 people have uh, uh, tested positive for COVID nineteen. Out of which three four again tested negative after subsequent testing. So. Uh, it's uh, so we have. I mean, uh, will the clubs take charge of the situation, or should BCCI ensure that they do it? How, how they do it? It's 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 not easy. It's it's not as simple as what it's been perceived by the board at the moment, as well as the club. So that kind of a set set protocol should be should be in place. Otherwise, I feel things can go very nasty. Absolutely, and I guess there are also some issues regarding. Uh, some of the former teams that were there in the competition, uh, there's yeah. been a lot of legal battles around it, and some of these throw a lot of questions about the structure of the IPL itself. So, could you talk a bit about that also? So, in in between all this talk about uh, salvaging the season and uh, ensuring that their losses are minimal and revenue comes in and all these things, BCCI is the biggest revenue source that I mean, the IPL. Uh, a small news came out last week that. Uh, 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 Mumbai High Court appointed arbitrator for the PCCI versus Deccan Chargers. I mean, right. we all would remember they were the second season champions, Hyderabad based team, predecessor to mm -hmm. Sunrisers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were suddenly terminated from the, uh, from the league in 2012. And there were many intricate, I mean, many. Uh, I mean, the situation by in which they were terminated was questionable in itself because a 30-day period, which is as per the contract, was give, uh, should be given to for them to answer or reply to the termination notice. And on the 29th day, apparently, they had BCCI, the IPL governing council went, went ahead and terminated the contract. Anyways, the case was filed and the uh, arbitrator now have dis has decided that BCCI should pay a compensation of 4,800 4, crore to taking charges. So this was decided last week, uh, announced last week. So BCCI can, of course, up, go for an appeal at the Bombay High Court first and then higher court if needed, uh, based on what the decision is. But uh, going by the history of BCCI versus wronged franchises, uh, I mean, it it just paints a picture of of a business done very haphazardly. Right, right. So, uh, before this, the case that that uh, that happened was the illegal termination of the uh, premature termination of uh, contract with Kochi Tuskers. That happened in 2011, and subsequently cases were filed. And uh, 2017, uh, the arbitrator had. Uh, decided that the bcci should 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 compensate tuskers for the for the termination and last year the in the accrued interest plus the compensation amount was in the tune of 1750 crore and every month the interest has been rising bcci has not shown an inclination towards sorting the issue maybe find a compromise formula and of course, they are obliged to pay and uh, legally obliged to play. And uh, 
uh, that waiting game is happening on one side. So this is how uh, I mean BCCI runs its business on one side, and then they are trying to milk the system and the situation on the other side. So it's it's it it paints a very uh, bleak picture of of the biggest cricket board in the world because as as the richest cricket board in the world the first and foremost thing that they should probably ensure is 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 governance and setting the right precedent as far as finances and financial deals are concerned so that that is missing and these two episodes are classic cases of that again so but yeah once the action starts all these things like like nero did long back that let the games begin and everything will be forgotten. So right. that's uh, that's the formula that BCCI and I mean cricket, Indian cricket has has been following so far. And I guess to to make a change to that, it it requires probably an effort from from us fans as well. Right. Right. Thank you so much, Leslie, for talking to us. Our next story is about the three countries that are ravaged the most by COVID nineteen: the United States, Brazil, and India. These are all in the Million Cases League, with the US having about 3 million cases and Brazil crossing the 2 million mark. What also links these countries is the leadership, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro and Narendra Modi, who came to power based on a politics of aggressive polarization. A lot of the same has marked their response to the COVID-19 crisis as well. Here's a video on the big three of COVID-19. Today, three countries lead the global COVID-19 case count, the United States, Brazil and India. These three countries are also currently reporting the highest number of new cases. What links the three countries is the rule of strongmen, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, and Narendra Modi. The high number of cases is strongly linked to how each of these leaders has handled the pandemic. Each of these authoritarian leaders has consolidated power on the lines of race and religion and is backed by big capital. Their policies have played a great role in increasing the disparity in their respective countries and attacking people's rights. Yet another commonality is their ignoring of science, promotion of superstition, and even outright denial. It has been seven months since the first case of COVID-19 was discovered in China in December last year. China had around 85,000 confirmed cases, as well as 4,641 deaths. But they managed to curb the spread of the virus and became corona-free by the end of April. The Chinese had to undertake this ordeal under heavy imperialist propaganda and racism. The virus was in fact initially reported by global media as the Wuhan virus. One of the key proponents of this xenophobic rhetoric was the US President Donald Trump himself. COVID, to be specific, COVID-19. That name gets further and further away from China as opposed to calling it the Chinese virus. By the way, it's a disease without question, has more names than any disease in history. I can name Kung Flu. I can name 19 different versions of names. To date, Trump has been in constant denial of the seriousness of the virus. His counterparts in Brazil and India have taken a similar approach. Jair Bolsonaro, who himself is COVID positive, has time and again been in denial of the virus. He called the virus just a little cold. The world has shown us that the risk group is people over 60 years old. So why close the schools? Is one of his infamous remarks. He even said that the press is causing panic and hysteria in Brazilian society while reporting on COVID-19. His public stand against lockdown has made his relationship with governors of various states turbulent. As of July 16th, Brazil has more than 1,966,000 confirmed cases, as well as over 75,300 deaths. India has over 968,800 confirmed cases and over 24,900 deaths. The actual numbers may be even higher. Meanwhile, the Modi government has been busy privatizing public sector undertakings, increasing taxes on petroleum products, and witch hunting activists. After forcefully retiring staff from various PSUs, the government plans to privatize most of them, including Indian railways. Activists and critics of the government have been put behind bars. 
In the name of reforms, more austerity has been introduced and farmers' and workers' rights are being taken away. Meanwhile, unemployment has soared while COVID-19-related restrictions continue. In the U.S., while early epicenters like New York City have seen a sharp decline in new cases, other states, like Texas and Florida, are showing a record number of cases. Trump has remained firm in his anti-lockdown stance and has held a series of controversial campaign rallies in hotspot states. Meanwhile, as protests continue against racism in the country, Trump and his allies have taken to statements and media to vilify protesters and encourage heavy criminalization of those arrested. To date, the U.S. still accounts for the largest number of COVID-19-related deaths, with 137,100, and the number is still rising. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.